Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID debunking video. This week, I'm back to looking at Dr. John Campbell. John Campbell is a very popular YouTube channel that claims to offer objective scientific information, but really he's just fumbling through literature and saying what anti-vaxxers want to hear. Yeah, he kind of took a turn towards doing that when he started talking about ivermectin and that pulled in buku views and bucks for his channel, so he just kept doing it. And I didn't really want to make another video about John Campbell, but recently he's been consistently making egregiously bad and harmful claims in regards to natural immunity against COVID and Omicron. So here we are talking about him again, and the topic is natural immunity. So when it comes to this topic, there are two major questions to consider. Is vaccination better at natural immunity than preventing severe outcomes of COVID like hospitalization, ICU admission, and death. And if someone has recovered from COVID, do they gain significant benefits from getting vaccinated? And just a quick aside, by vaccination in this context, I mean three doses because we now know that mRNA vaccines are at least a three-dose course when it comes to COVID. So in John Campbell's most recent video on natural immunity, does he actually address those questions with the data that he tries to review in the video? Let's find out. Now, it's getting a bit scientifically embarrassing, the extent to which authorities are not talking about natural immunity. And in this video, we're going to talk about the equivalence between natural immunity and vaccination, and indeed the, the possible uh, superiority of natural immunity. And this really needs to be taken into account. So this might be a reasonable policy if it was shown that infection confers an equal protection against severe disease and death, then vaccination. But as I'll explain in this video, it doesn't, so this is not a good policy to have. And there's the other aspect to consider, that if the policy allowed for people with history of infection to not get vaccinated, that might encourage people to go out and purposely get infected. Seriously. There are enough anti-vaxxers out there that this would happen. Not a good policy, okay? So if we had gone for natural immunity without the vaccinations, there would be more, there would have been more severe illness and there would have been more deaths overall. Some individuals wouldn't have suffered vaccine side effects, but overall the vaccines have reduced morbidity and mortality. But, but there's an unnaturalistic fallacy as well. So for one shining moment in this video, John Campbell says something reasonable. Then he includes a but. And there's got to be a but because he's got to say what those anti-vaxxers want to hear, doesn't he? Anyway, he muses on for a little while about how you can't consider something better just because it's natural, but you also can't consider something better because it's synthetic, and that he's going to show you data to show one way or the other. But he doesn't do a great job of that, so let's continue. It cannot be deemed necessary to uh, require vaccination for those with natural immunity. Now, we've been saying this for a long time. Good to see that the British Medical Journal is in uh, agreement. Full papers there do, uh, do read it. Well, no, the British Medical Journal is a journal. It does not take a stance on scientific issues one way or another. This is just an article that was published in the British Medical Journal. You can't say the journal agrees with it, John. It's not how it works. So rationale for uh, vaccine mandates, what would be the rationale? Preventing healthcare systems becoming overwhelmed. This was necessary in the past. Still necessary, John. Still necessary. And if we look at the amount of transmission now as a result of Omicron, I think we can see that the vaccines are not preventing community viral transmission. No, John, you can't just look at cases and say that vaccines aren't working. Vaccines absolutely reduce your chances of spreading SARS-CoV-2 to other individuals, but it is not 100%. So when countries remove all restrictions against COVID all at once, human behavior changes, then cases are going to go up. When it comes to reducing transmission of something as contagious as SARS-CoV-2, then you need multiple implementations in place to have meaningful reductions in those cases. It's similar to how with cars we don't stop at seatbelts. We also have airbags and mandatory inspections and automatic braking, so on and so forth. I've talked about the data several times before on this channel, but there are several experiments that directly show that vaccinated individuals are less likely to transmit SARS-CoV-2 than unvaccinated people. They do reduce it. 
Those links will be in the description, John. I hope you read them. All of the included studies found at least statistically equivalence between the protection of full vaccine and natural immunity. So same, same, that they are the, the same in this data. And three studies found superiority of natural immunity, as this study here looks at a lot of different, uh, different cases, a pretty thorough uh, piece of work it is, in fact. Okay, so this review article published in the BMJ is what John Campbell focuses on for his entire video, and he claims that it is thorough, but it is not. It is lacking some key papers published on this topic, papers that were published long before it was even written. So the fact that he's claiming that it's thorough either shows that he's not up on the literature or he just doesn't care and was really sloppy and lazy in this video, which... I'll let you decide which is true in this case. So what does John choose to highlight in this paper and why does it not reflect the literature? Let's start to answer those questions. Vaccinations recover people is of marginal benefit on an absolute basis. This is really easy to demonstrate as false. It's been known for a long time that those who recovered from COVID and got just a single dose of mRNA vaccine have a much better immunity than before, before they got the vaccination. This was given the term hybrid immunity, and regardless on how you feel about that term, it was shown that hybrid immunity has a much, much better neutralizing breadth profile than those who just got infected and did not get vaccinated. In other words, even in recovered individuals, those who got vaccinated had a much wider breadth of memory B cells and memory T cells able to fight a much wider array of SARS-CoV-2 variants, which in a world where SARS-CoV-2 variants are still coming out because most of the world is still dealing with cases, that's pretty important. But John doesn't seem to mention any of that literature here, which is a huge, huge miss. Uh, for example, Omicron in adults aged 65 and over um, who've been vaccinated, minimal or no effect against mild disease with Omicron variants from 20 weeks after the second dose of the Oxford vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. Multiple times throughout this video, John is referring to data regarding mild infection. And like I said at the beginning of this video, that is far from the most important thing to focus on here. What we really care about is preventing those severe outcomes of COVID, death, hospitalization, ICU admission. That is the whole point of vaccination, and it's thus what we should compare if we want to compare immunity following infection against immunity following vaccination. Now, this review does have one paper comparing hospitalization rates of recovered individuals against vaccinated individuals. And in this case, vaccination in that study meant two doses, because that study is rather old at this point. It does not look at three doses versus infection. But here's what John had to say about that. But um, this is the important point here. A protection from prior infection against severe outcomes from Omicron remained robust. So 87.8% protection against severe disease. See, this is what I mean where John is just fumbling through the literature and saying what anti-vaxxers want to hear. If you actually look at this paper, it's comparing two doses of mRNA vaccine against natural infection in protection against hospitalization for Omicron. Now, when Omicron came along, a lot changed. That is what showed us that three doses of mRNA vaccine is really what you need in order to deal with all the variants that were emerged at that time. In papers that are not captured in this review or in John's video, this is shown pretty clearly that rates of hospitalization and severe outcome are drastically reduced with either three doses or a boost after recovery. This is reflected in multiple data sets, so if John really cares about reducing risk as much as possible, he would recommend his viewers get vaccinated even if they've recovered from COVID, but he doesn't do that. If he were up on the immunological data, that has been gathered throughout the pandemic on how our immune systems change after multiple exposures to the spike antigen, then this would not be a surprising result. But instead, this is what he has to say about that topic. Vaccine requirements have significant costs. Financial costs are high, as we've looked at. Really, John? No. 
Vaccines prevent people from getting sick. They prevent people from getting hospitalized and dying. These are all things that hurt an economy when they happen in mass. Vaccines save a lot of money in the long run for society. It's really only people who deny the science and refuse to follow basic public health guidelines who put themselves in a position where they suffer financially. So maybe help people get out of that by informing them about the science properly. How about that, John? Uh, substantial infringement of uh, individual liberty by having vaccine mandates for those that are already infected. I would agree with that. Do you still think that he's not just saying what anti-vaxxers want to hear? This infringement on liberty is a classic anti-vaccine talking point. It's as old as smallpox vaccines in the early 1900s. Public health is public health. It is not an infringement on your rights. It is so that we as a society can live together and not suffer from infectious disease. And there are non-trivial risks associated with vaccination. So there are risks associated with vaccination and they are not trivial. Direct quotes from that paper. Absolutely, there are some risks to vaccination. Nothing is 100% risk-free, but the severe outcomes of vaccination are few and far between, and extremely rare, whereas COVID is killing millions of people all around the world. So pick your poison, people. What do you want? Millions of dead people or millions of saved lives with some risk that we try our best to mitigate as much as possible with new recommendations and new guidelines. I think that's an easy choice. So why, why is it that national agencies are not taking into account natural immunity it's almost as if they're trying to pu push out as many vaccines as possible now that was good in the past now the risk benefit analysis has changed so why are they doing this because the benefits still far outweigh the risks john and there is substantial benefit to being vaccinated after you recover from covid that is clearly shown in the literature and you're just ignoring it why is it still this simplistic idea that we better not share any nuance with the public that we better just say everyone gets vaccinated and that's the end of it so all, all the plebs go oh we need to get vaccinated and that's the end of it let's trot off and get vaccinated is that is that what they're saying if so that's insulting no it's not what they're saying it's reflecting the data that there is clear benefit from getting vaccinated following recovery from covid and what's really insulting john is that you are this lazy about going through the literature and conveying it to your viewers. It shows blatant disrespect for them. It shows that you don't care to offer them good, accurate, nuanced scientific information. You just want to say what they want to hear so that you can get your views and collect your AdSense checks. Sorry if that's harsh, but that's the reality. Or, or is it something more than that, that, that we are not being made aware of? I'll leave that one with, with you. What does that even mean, John? You're openly suggesting conspiracy theories now. Where is the person you used to be? The uh, final one I want to look at is uh, this. Uh, the biopharmaceutical industry provides 75% of the FDA's uh, drug review budget. As if it wasn't clear that he is openly suggesting conspiracy theories and pandering to anti-vaxxers, there you go. He's showing this article, which he apparently hasn't even read. Yes, it's true that the FDA receives a large portion of its budget from user fees that pharmaceutical companies pay the FDA whenever they send applications for new drugs. It takes a lot of work to review all of the new drug applications that come to the FDA. They have to pay people to do that work. So Congress doesn't want to fund all of that. Instead, they make the pharmaceutical companies pay the FDA for their services. That's all that that means. This is explained in the article, and it even points out that you would think that maybe this would mean that every new drug application would get rubber stamped. But that's not the case. Most new drug applications don't get approved. This article even spells out that when people who work in research and development are asked about 
FDA and any bias toward pharmaceutical companies, they laugh. And as someone who works in industry, I agree. The FDA is very strict and very annoying with all of their rules and what they ask for. It's not a situation where everyone's just shaking hands, patting each other on the back and saying, yep, this looks good. Here's your money. Let's go for it. I don't care about anything. Let's just send this out. No, that's not what happens. But John doesn't seem to care about any of those details or perspectives. He seems to only care about offering this anti-vaccine friendly view to his viewers so that he remains popular and paid. And it's just sad to see. The topic of immunity following infection with SARS-CoV-2 versus vaccination is a rich and detailed topic in the scientific literature. It can get complicated real fast, and there's a ton to learn. John does a really poor job of making that clear in his video and offering quality education. So hopefully I've offered a little bit more perspective here, and you can look at all of the data that I've gathered on this topic in the description below. They're all linked and free to read so that you can try to teach yourself on this topic if you really care about it. So which is better, immunity following infection or vaccination? Well, a full course of three doses of mRNA vaccine is going to give you a very robust and durable immune memory capable of tackling pretty much any variant that we know of right now. Infection alone does not give you that you need to boost with vaccination in order to achieve the same level of breadth and robust immune memory. And of course, a really important point here is that vaccination is a hell of a lot safer than getting infected. Not only does getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 put you at risk of severe outcomes, it puts you at risk of spreading it to others and thus putting others at risk you want to reduce the risk of all of those outcomes as safely as possible. And the best way to do that is vaccination. So regardless of whether or not you've been infected with SARS-CoV-2, get vaccinated. It's the safest, best way to go. That reflects the data, so the policy reflects the data as well. Well, that's going to do it for this week's video. I have no doubt that this is going to attract a fair amount of hate from John Campbell fans, but to those people... I challenge you to just read the literature, and if you want to talk to me about it, you can message me directly or attend one of my future live streams. You can heckle me, I'll deal with you, we can talk about it, it'll be fine. Anyway, like I said, all the links to all the science that I talk about in this video are in the description for you to read freely for yourself. Thank you, as always, for watching. I really do appreciate it. And if you liked it, don't forget to give the video a like and subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.